respected brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy upon all of us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi wa rahman wa rahim. Walhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi amma ba'd. So I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Many people in this time might ask, where is Allah's mercy? But that is because they don't understand. They don't understand the reality of this dunya. They don't understand that this dunya is a test. And it is from Allah's mercy that Allah bring these tests so that perhaps people can return to Him. Perhaps a sinner can return, make tawbah, and seek Allah's forgiveness, and return to Him, and so be forgiven by Him. This is a great mercy and a great bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many people, when they are sick, don't they return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Will they turn back to Him, make tawbah, and change their lives? So, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving some intense lessons to the world of His power and His majesty. Because the, the people in the world right now, they were on a high when it came to um, their status and their position and all these things. And so Allah is bringing them to their knees. And this is from His mercy to them. Because the proud are not going to enter Jannah. Right? The thing that destroyed, Iblis was pride. Allah said that in the Quran. When Allah commanded him to prostrate after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, Allah commanded the angels to prostrate to Adam, and Iblis was amongst them. So the command was for him also. Allah said, Abba was takbar. He refused to prostrate, and he was proud. It, because of his pride, he refused to prostrate. When people get too, too rich and too much power and all these things, they tend to lose respect for everything, including themselves. And even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and as such, they start feeling as if they are the powerful. And they start feeling a pride and an arrogance that is not befitting for any human being. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he does is humiliate them from his mercy to human beings because Allah wants to give everyone a chance to return to him, to seek his forgiveness, to come back, to get to Jannah. But most of mankind are rebellious and they would, they would end up in hell. After when we recognize Allah's mercy is so vast, and it might manifest in ways that we cannot imagine. I mean, at least the place where we are, there's quite a few from 3 o'clock in the evening until after Fajr. The people who are in charge here are setting up laws for us to really, you know, protect ourselves and, 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 and protect other people also in case we are sick, we don't affect them. So, Alhamdulillah, you know, it is really to me a big mercy because I have a time now to sit up with my children I mean, for longer hours, we pray together. I mean, we can't do this normally. We can't pray jama'ah at home with my sons. So now that I'm here, I can sit with them after every salat. We can talk. We can discuss things. We can show each other where things, I mean, where we need a little bit more, you know, emphasis so that we can change our lives and make our lives better. And things like that, you know. So it is nicer. It is really nice. So Allah has given us the time to really sit down and get ourselves together with our families and at the same time a time for reflection that look you know mashallah the thing that we were taking for granted all of a sudden become closed off the masajids the masajid they are all closed off right now i mean we can't go for it which is again as i said it is from it is from the mercy of allah that the people who are in charge have set down these rules for us you know brothers and sisters let us be grateful to Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really merciful to us. And we should thank Him and praise Him because, I mean, as Muslims, we can look at these things and we can see His wisdom. We can see His vast wisdom and His vast majesty and His power manifested in a way that, I mean, I never saw it before like this. And so we have to praise Allah for this vast bounty that He's blessed us with to give us the guidance and to give us the ability to understand the guidance. So Alhamdulillah. And we always say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. And then we say, Salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah, ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. And we send Salat and Salam for the Messenger of Allah, his family and companions, 
and then we get into our subject by what follows. So respected brothers and sisters, we praise Allah the Most High and I'm very happy to welcome you to another presentation of this series for which our theme is Understanding the Concept of Ibadah. Okay, and now we are not doing it directly, we are doing it indirectly because we are dealing with Ramadan and fasting. Inshallah in this presentation, we'll continue discussing important issues relating to Ramadan and fasting. Now when I say this, most people think I'm going to discuss Ramadan first and the virtues of Ramadan and what is contained in Ramadan like like the Qadr and fasting and uh, Etikaf and the forgiveness and the doors of heaven are open. All of them and the doors of hell are closed, all of them. And there's a caller calling out every night, Ya Baghi al Khair Akbil, O seeker of goodness, come forth. Okay, and there's goodness in the month, goodness, so come forth, come for the good. So many people, when I say we're going to discuss important issues relating to Ramadan and fasting, right, they would think that these are the foremost, or the foremost might be fasting, because fasting, the entire month is an obligation. But this is not the foremost. The foremost issue for a Muslim in every situation is the strongest handhold. Holding on to the most trustworthy handhold. La ilaha illallah. Holding on to the most trustworthy handhold. It never breaks. This handhold never breaks. It is only if we let loose, then, then we put ourselves to destruction. But if we hold on to it, it never breaks. And it is going to take us it is going to take us to Jannah. It is going to take us to success. So this is what we have to get sorted out it's within our hearts. Because La ilaha illallah, there is nothing next to it. There is nothing as powerful. There is nothing as majestic. There is nothing as great. There is nothing that stands next to it or has the value of it. La ilaha illallah is the beginning and the end. And everything falls in between. So we have to hold on to it from the beginning to the end. We can't ever lose it. Anytime we lose it, we're only causing ourselves travesty and trials. This is the essence of Islam. This is what the Prophet was calling to all his life. For all his life. So it's important, brothers and sisters, that we pay attention, right, to this kalima, la ilaha illallah, and make sure that it is foremost in our life, in our heart, in our every moment of our every day. Every moment of our every day, this should be our focus, la ilaha illallah. Right? And this is why, you know, we should set our day around the Salat. And inshallah, inshallah, um, I plan to start doing a series of, uh, of short videos dealing with how a Muslim day should be organized. I mean, especially in connection to Ramadan. So I'm going to be sending those videos. Inshallah, I'll start it tomorrow after I finish these classes tomorrow evening and I start, um, I get some time. And inshallah, I'm going to start dealing with it. Right? But I'm going to discuss every aspect of the day. From the time you get up in the morning, what you have to do according to Islam, to really be doing it according to what Allah wants, to live your life according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to live it, how He wants you to live it, following the example of the Prophet. So, inshallah, I mean, this here, I would, I mean, now that you have time, you have to sit home, you have a lot of time, use your time well. Do not spend your time on the internet that much. If you can cut it off fully, it's better, except if you have classes and you have some important thing to do, like memorizing Quran, or going to your Quran teacher, or something like that. But don't just go onto the net just like that, for nothing. But the, the WhatsApp, all of these things, try to diminish it in this time that you have now, in Sha'aban, and try to get into Sha'aban, and start using it for Ramadan. Start fasting, start getting closer to your Quran, read more Quran. So, alhamdulillah, so the most important thing, brothers and sisters, is to set your life around, the most important action after La ilaha illallah, which is Salat. Let the Salat encompass all your life, every aspect. The most important thing is that if you can start, if you can connect to Allah properly through the Salat, inshallah, then you will be holding on to the most trustworthy and hold in the most in the best way. Because this is the way. This the Salat is what is what is the test to test you. You want to know exactly how you are with Allah? Check your Salat. Check your salah. Check your salah. Are you the masjid for the brothers? Are you praying it on time? Are you praying your sunan? You know, check your salah. How are you in the salah? So today we are going to still talk a little bit about this and then we're going to discuss, inshallah, some rulings in relation to fasting. 
everyone wants to go to Jannah. And the only requirement, the only primary requirement for this is to correctly understand and apply the testimony of faith called the Shahada La Ilaha Illallah. Because La Ilaha Illallah means that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah. Now if you know that Allah alone deserves to be worshipped, then you would know that he is the only one who has to make laws for your life and he is the only one who has to tell you what is worship. So you go back to him to find that and you would find that salat is an act of worship that he wants you to do. Not for himself, but for yourself and fasting and all the acts of worship that Allah has legislated for us brothers and sisters only benefits us. He doesn't benefit. Allah needs nothing. Allah needs not, eat, not any one of us. He created all of us. What need does he have for his creation? None. He can destroy all of it and he can create another creation like that and better than that. You know? So the, the, the point is that you want to go to Jannah? There's only one requirement to understand and apply La ilaha illallah. Because this is the most trustworthy handhold which would never break. It never breaks. You hold on to it and you know in the end, regardless of what, you put your trust in Allah and you hold on to that. You know when Yunus was in the, in the belly of the whale, he said, La ilaha illa anta. Instead of saying La ilaha illallah, he said, La ilaha illa anta. Anta you. Direct. You know, La ilaha illallah is like third person. There is no deity worthy of worship but Allah. It's like third person. But when you say La ilaha illa anta, there is no deity worthy of worship but you, O Allah. It's different. Now there's direct communion. You're talking directly to Allah. So he said, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka. How perfect are you, O Allah? Inni kuntu min al And indeed I am from those who are oppressive to themselves. So he acknowledged his weakness. He acknowledged his deficiency and his fault. Like he's turning back to Allah. And what did Allah do? Allah saved him. Allah saved him. In his most severe trial, when Ibrahim alayhi salam was being cast into the fire, he said, Hasbi Allah. Hasbi Allah. Enough for me is Allah. Allah is sufficient. I have Allah, then that's it. I don't need anything else. And that is the reality. Ask me Allah. Enough for me is Allah. Allah would suffice me. And this is something that we should say every day seven times in the morning and seven times in the evening. Ask me Allah. La ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkalt wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. Allahu Akbar. In this, in this la ilaha illahu, there is no deity worthy of worship but him. You know, this kalimah is still coming in so many things that you have to say every day. Like, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la lahu mulk wa lahu lam wa huwa ala kulli shayin kadeer. If you say it every day, a hundred times, there are so many things that you're protected from. But the point is that what I want to emphasize to you is La ilaha illallah is the, the answer for every one of our problems. Every one of it. Every one of it. You are poor, that is the answer. You are rich, that is the answer. You need to put your trust in Allah. We need to put our trust, we need to depend on him fully, fully. You are afraid of coronavirus, don't worry about it. Whatever has to happen is going to happen. If you have to get it, it's because your Lord, who you are putting your trust in, wants it to happen to you. So the point is, brothers and sisters, there's nothing, 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 nothing at the level of La ilaha illallah. Try to sit down and ponder over this kalima. This kalima is what life is about. So, inshallah, now that we know this, it will never break. What is required from one who truly witnesses to La ilaha illallah? The first thing. The first thing is, you must know it. Because if you know it, mashallah. If you know it, that's it. Everything is safe. You are safe. You are safe. If you know La ilaha illallah, because you would know that all the answers is right there. You would know it. You know La ilaha illallah. You would know that the answers for every single situation and problem that is in this world is found in this kalima, la ilaha illallah. So the first, the first requirement, would you want to say, you say you witness the la ilaha illallah, how much do you know la ilaha illallah? That's the first thing you have to ask yourself. Do I know it? Because Allah commands, fa'alam annahu la ilaha illahu. No, la ilaha illallah. Know that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. This is in Surah Muhammad, Ayah 19. Allah says this, know it, have knowledge of it. 
See this no here? K-N-O-W. So no, la ilaha illallah. Fa'alam. It's a command. You must know it. And you should go and read Surah Muhammad. Read the ayats. Read the very first ayat. And the second ayat. Read it, read it. Read the first page. And contemplate the, the strength of this surah. So everyone must, must know. Must know it. You must know it. You must know all that is required of one who declares it. And you must know what destroys it of kufr and shirk. And we discussed some of this last week. In the, in the flyer that I sent you, I discussed some kufr and shirk. This knowledge of kufr and shirk, this here, of kufr and shirk, is contained in the kalima itself, which has two pillars. La ilaha, which means there is no deity. When you say la ilaha, this la here is called la nafil al jins. It negates everything that follows it. What is after it? Deity. Ilah is a deity. Ilah is anything that is taken as an object of worship. So here, it's not just there is no deity. It is there is absolutely no object worthy of worship. Negates all, all things worship other than Allah. All types of idolatry. You know, some people have money as their idol. Money is their everything. They have their shine car is their idol. They have it, they buy the Mercedes and they put it in the driveway and they just look at it and they take the train to go to work. Because it is idolizing their heart. They feel, you know, this kind of, you know, this is what they worship. Oh, look at my car. And they, you have to be careful. I mean, you can own it, but you have to make sure that it is not, it is not taking your heart. If it fills the heart, then that's it. The heart is only supposed to be filled with la ilaha illallah. Anything that comes in there in that heart has to be in there because it falls under la ilaha illallah. So my, I love my wife and I love my children and I love my brothers in Islam because of la ilaha illallah. I love the, the, beauty, the beautiful things that Allah has given me because of la ilaha illallah so that I can use it to worship him and to submit myself to him, not use it to oppress others, not use it against others. So this is contained in the kalima, la ilaha, there is no deity. No deity worthy of worship. None. It negates all things worship other, other than Allah, which is idolatry. And even our desires, you know. Allah says in the Quran, Or do you look to the one who takes his desire as his ilah, as his object of worship? So some people worship their desires. So we have to be careful, right? That our desire does not come in the way when Allah's law is there. Allah sets down his law, then we have to really just submit to it. And the word illa means except Allah. So it affirms that all kinds of worship are only for Allah alone and for no one else. That is why when the Prophet Sallallahu told the, the people of, of Quraysh, when he told the Quraysh, I mean, la ilaha, say la ilaha illallah, you're going to be successful. They say, are you going to make all of these aliha into one ilah? All of these gods, you're going to put it as one god now? You know? So the point is that they understood the meaning of la ilaha illallah. They understood, they understood it. The problem, our problem, is we don't understand la ilaha illallah, right? So the la ilaha illallah, the first part, it negates all things worship other than Allah. And the word illallah, it means it affirms all kind of worship must be devoted to Allah. This here, I mean, is established clearly in the fact that Allah says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقِّ That is because Allah is the truth. وَأَنَّمَا يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ هُوَ الْبَاطِلِ and that which they call upon other than him is also all of it is possible you understand so you have to know that so you have to know tawhid because tawhid talks about allah's oneness and that he alone deserves to be worshipped and you have to know kufr and shirk all aspects of it you have to know this this is an important requirement brothers and sisters so if you don't know what is shirk some people don't even know the meaning of shirk they don't know the meaning of kufr much less understanding what it is so you have to know the first thing if you don't know, if you just know la ilaha illallah, if you just know, if you just know who Allah is and that He alone deserves to be worshipped, do you know all the aspects of worship? Do you know the aspects of worship of the heart, like fear of Allah and hope in Allah and tawakkul ala Allah and, and 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 love for Allah and 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 putting your trust in Allah? You know, seeking His help alone. Do you know all these things? Do you know all the aspects of worship? Sacrificing for Him alone. Do we know? 
Do we know if, if we are worshiping Allah? Do we, do we know what are the things that destroy it? So we have to, because kufr and shirk destroys our act of worship, and I hope that point is gotten. The second thing is certainty. No person meets Allah with these two shahada, not doubting in them, and is denied paradise. Right? No person, anybody who comes with these two kalima, with these two shahada, he doesn't have any doubt in them, he's not going to be denied paradise. This is according to the Prophet. This is a hadith. If you see things in italics in this um, slide, it is in a hadith of the Prophet. Right? And Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا Indeed, only, only, only those are believers who believe in Allah and the Messenger and they have to have no doubt. They have no doubt, absolutely no doubt concerning Allah and His Messenger. Do we have any doubt in Allah? Allah asks that. Allah asks that question. Is there any doubt concerning Allah? The creator of the heavens and the earth. Do you have any doubt? Check your heart, brothers and sisters, because doubt is kufr. We're going to deal with kufr, inshallah, from next week. We're going to start dealing with, with kufr and shirk to explain some aspects of it, inshallah. Right? So at least you would know exactly what it is. Okay? So that is the other thing. Certainty. That negates doubt. There must be absolutely no doubt whatsoever. The third thing about this is that you must accept. Accept this kalima. It's called, this certainty is called al-yaqeen. Alright? Acceptance is called qubul. Al-qubul means to accept and submit to what these words implies, both in one's heart as well as verbally, and also along with the body parts. So in your heart, there must be full acceptance of this kalima, la ilaha illallah. Anything Islam says, I accept. Anything, I have to accept and submit to it fully. In your heart, from your heart. And you have to say it with your tongue too. And your body part has to manifest it. I mean, sometimes you will find that we have weaknesses in it, but that is from any weakness we find in relation to these things, you know, in relation to these things, it's only going to be to our detriment. Okay? Inshallah. So be careful, brothers and sisters. Be very careful. Okay. The fourth is following what it demands. As none of you truly believe until his desires is in accordance with that which I have brought. Prophet says, La yu'min wa hadukum. La yu'min wa hadukum. Hatta, hatta yakuna hawahu taba'an lima jittu bi. None of you truly believe until his desire is in accordance with that which I have brought. Remember I said, do you not look to the one who has taken his desire as his object of worship, as his ilah? Prophet is saying here, none of you truly believe until his desire, his desire, his desire is in accordance with what I, that is what Muhammad has brought. So even what you desire, you must first find out, is it in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet If it is not, then you are not following properly because this is the essence of what following means. This is what following really means. You understand? This is the true essence of following. So inshallah, brothers and sisters, pay attention. The fifth, the fifth condition is truthfulness as opposed to lying. Truthfulness as opposed to lying. You must be truthful. There must be sidq in your in your professing or your acknowledging or your establishing this kalima if you want it to be a correct witness. So there is no one who witnesses that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. And that Muhammad is a slave and messenger truthfully from his heart. But Allah will make forbidden for him the hellfire. So this is important. You must, it must, you must be truthful about it. You must accept it and submit to it. You must be sincere with it. You must be, you know, all of these are conditions that are, you must have no doubt in. There's no doubt. If you have doubt, it's trouble. Doubt is covered. You can't doubt. How can you be doubt? How can you doubt in something that is so firm? La ilaha illallah. It is the most trustworthy handhold. How can anyone have doubt in it? Unless someone who is confused. Right? So may Allah make us have true understanding of it. The sixth one is sincerity. Which means that actions are free from any element of shirk. 
including doing things for show or boasting. The most deserving of my intercession are those who say La ilaha illallah mukhlisan min qalbi with sincerity from the heart. Okay? Sincerity with sincerity, sincerely from the heart. So you must make sure that there is nothing. When you're doing anything for Allah, try to keep it hidden with yourself. Try to do it as much as possible by yourself and with yourself. And try not to really, you know, let it show with other people. The seventh is to love Allah. Love la ilaha illallah. And what it implies and indicates. You have to love it. Love it. It's all good. Whatever la ilaha illallah implies, whatever Allah wants you to do, whatever Allah has, has made obligatory upon you is nice, so you should love it. Loving la ilaha illallah and what it implies and indicates. And love for the people who act upon it. This is the, the believers. So how is your love for the believers? Check your heart. This is what we should want. We should, we should love the believers, mashallah. Because they believe. They are people who love Allah. So if they love Allah, then I should love them. These are the people who most deserve my love more than anybody else. And obviously, if my parents, they are strong believers in Allah, and my children and my, my wife, then obviously, they, I, they, they, they are included in that at a higher level. Because, I mean, I have to love them from the point of um, they being connected to me in a physical way and also because they are, they are believers, inshallah. The strongest handhold of Iman, the strongest, awsaka, oral Iman, awsak, the handhold, awsaka, ura. Awsaka, ura, the most trustworthy handhold of Iman. The most, the strongest handhold of Iman is al hubbu fillahi wal bugdu fillah. It's a love for Allah and the hate for Allah. You love what Allah loves and you hate what He is. Allah loves goodness, Allah loves believers, Allah loves the, 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 the good doers, Allah loves the muttaqeen, then you love them. So you have to love the people who act upon this kalima and adhere to its conditions. And you have to hate whoever or whatever goes against it. Somebody's fighting this kalima, obviously. <clears throat> he has to be, I mean, you can't hold love for him in your heart. He's fighting his own, he's fighting, he's such a poor, he's fighting against his own self. They don't know what they're doing to themselves. So whatever goes against it or whatever, whoever goes against it or whoever fights it, then in your heart, you can't have that kind of love for them. There has to be some kind of abhorrence for this kind of action that they are doing, right? And then the Prophet says, "Salafatul man kunna fihi wajada halawatul iman." Whoever finds within within himself three traits has found the sweetness of iman. Three traits. The first one is that Allah and His Messenger be loved to Him more than anything else. That Allah and His Messenger be loved to Him more than anything else. So, how do you know if Allah is loved to you more than anything else? You love what Allah loves. You hate what Allah hates. You implement his commands and avoid his prohibitions. This is what, these are the essence of life. These are the essence, these are the most important things. Brothers and sisters, I mean, this is a very small, um, I can say, introduction to the kalima, inshallah. And it is not enough, definitely. Nobody can really do justice to the kalima in just a small session like this. But I hope that it, has, it would have made a difference to the way you now would look at the kalima. Yeah, I mean, you know, you would not want to investigate this kalima at a high level. You would not want to check it out and learn more about it and understand it. So that, inshallah, you know, you can practice it. The conclusion, if one fulfills the above, then he would naturally, naturally rely on Allah alone. Fear his torment and have hope in his mercy. Naturally, he would do these things. And all of the above, all of this, the reliance on Allah, the fear of his torment and hope for his mercy, and hope in his mercy, all of them are acts of worship of the heart, all of them. Similarly, he would hasten to fulfill the, requir the requirements for acts of worship relating to the body parts like salat, fasting, zakat, hajj, dhikr, dua, recitation of the Quran, goodness to parents, etc. Okay? You understand? Brothers and sisters, do you understand this? Before we go on, do you understand this? Do you get a, do you get a feel of the, the value of this kalima and the strength of this kalima? So what I want you to do is to really spend some more time with it, go over and listen to the lecture, and maybe if you can find any other lectures on La ilaha illallah or any discussion on it, inshallah, then inshallah make an effort to, to put it into practice and get it sorted out, inshallah. Okay? All right, let us get down to um, what is necessary to know before Ramadan begins. You know, as a Muslim who's looking forward to Ramadan, inshallah, and who wants to fast in this great month, inshallah, and who wants the full blessing of this month, Okay, um, 
there are certain things that are necessary to know, like how you need to know about Allah to worship Him properly. You know, that's the first condition, right? Just like that, in relation to Ramadan, you need to know from before what are the regulations concerning Ramadan this month. What does this month contain? And how can you get the, bene the, best, the best of this month? One of the greatest acts of Ramadan is fasting. Fasting is obligatory in Ramadan, right? So we must be clear, inshallah, in relation to this. Uh, we just discussed, I mean, uh, about la ilaha illallah and the physical acts of worship, and we, we, we mentioned fasting, right? Fasting is one of those things that you have to get right. So, inshallah, I want you to spend time with it. This you must know. The definition of the word fasting, saum, which is fast or fasting, literally means to abstain or keep away from something. You keep away from something, you you abstain from it, you're fasting. Like Maryam salam in Surah Maryam, she said, Inni nathartu rahmani sauma. Indeed, I have made a vow for a fast to the most merciful. I'm fasting for him. Right? And what did she do? So I'm not going to, to, to speak to not one person today. So I'm not going to speak to any human being today. So she was using the word sound and it was indicating that she was, that she is staying away from speech. Okay? So this is what it means to abstain from something. So anyone who abstains from something or keep away from it, then that person is fasting from that thing. Right? In Islamic usage, however, and this is what you have to know, this is what is important for you to know. You must know this, right? Because this is what you have to keep up with for the entire day that you're fasting. And this does not only go for Ramadan, but for any other fast that you do. In Islamic usage, however, it means to have the pure intention to only please Allah, first thing. So the first thing about the fasting, like any other act of worship, is to have the pure intention to only please Allah the Most High. Okay? By abstaining from food, drink, and sexual intercourse from dawn to sunset of any day. These are the requirements. Okay? In Islamic usage, however, it means to have the pure intention to only please Allah the Most High by abstaining from food, drink, sexual intercourse from dawn to sunset of any day. So you have to know when it's dawn. You have to know when it's sunset so that you can really fulfill this in a proper way. But the most important thing about all of this, brothers and sisters, is to have the pure intention in this act of worship to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. It's very important that you understand this, right? That if you're going to fast, you must do it purely for Allah alone and only to please Him. So for example, if you're a child and your father commands you to fast, so you fast because of Him, that is incorrect. You have to do it only for Allah. Ruling for fasting in Ramadan. Allah the wise made fasting during Ramadan compulsory upon every Muslim who qualifies to fast. Notice, notice the requirement there. Allah made fasting during Ramadan compulsory upon every Muslim who qualifies to fast. They must qualify to fast, right? They must qualify. It's not just everybody have to fast. There are some people who don't have to fast. You have to qualify. Um, so you have to know what makes you qualify to fast also. Okay? So Allah says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ So whoever witnesses, that is, he is present during the month of Ramadan, a shahr, the month, he must fast it. فَلْيَسُمْ who? Then he must fast it. This is from the Surah Baqarah, I want 85, not Ayah 18. I think it's 185 or 180. Yeah, it's either 184 or 185. Okay? So whoever witnesses, that is, he is present during the month of Ramadan, he must fast the month if he qualifies or she qualifies, okay? So you have to know when the month starts so that you make sure you get on top of the month from the very beginning, okay? You, you have to know when the month ends so that you stop in time, right? You have to know, you have to know um, if you qualify and what makes you qualify. You have to know these things. You have to know about the intention, right? Because you have to make it pure. You have to make this fast pure for Allah. Establishing the beginning of Ramadan. So, the very first thing is that we establish the beginning of Ramadan. Since fasting in Ramadan is a pillar of Islam, it is one of the five pillars, right? We're going to come with that, inshallah. Allah, the all-knowing, ensured 
that the means to determine the beginning of this noble month is adequately clear and simple and within the means of everyone, even the ordinary person. Anybody can see the moon. You don't have to be an astrologer. And this is the, the technicality with this, with this trouble that we have in this time. You know, everything is dependent on one person. Oh, I mean, there was one brother by the name of Khalid Shokat. Everybody was talking, oh, Khalid Shokat says this about the moon. He has his graph of how the moon is supposed to be sighted and where it's supposed to be sighted. Later on, I found that there are other people who have other graphs. So, I mean, that alone discredits him for me, okay? I, in any case, I never really paid attention to him anyways or listened to him because, I mean, in my mind, that is not the way that Allah and his messenger has set down to really determine the beginning of the month. But as Muslims, we must know the means of determining the month must be simple. It must be available. Look, people in Africa, people in, 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 the, in the villages of India and Pakistan and, and, and in the mountains of Afghanistan and in, in Yemen and all of this, what I'm saying, though, is that Allah, the all-knowing, ensure that the means to determine the beginning of this noble month is adequately clear and simple. And within the means of everyone, even the ordinary person, thus, the beginning of the month is clearly clarified by the son of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa as follows. Okay? So this is what we have to know. This is, I mean, the month has to be, we have to try to figure it out, and everybody has to know. Even if a person can't read, they can see the moon. And sometimes they see it better than me. Okay? They don't know to read and write, but they can see the moon. So, I mean, this is the basis, you know. So, let us see what the Islamic ruling is concerning this sighting is, okay. So, the first thing is, sighting this crescent, that is the new moon, because we are looking for the crescent with the naked eye on the 29th day of the month of Sha'ban. Now, many Muslims don't do this. Many Muslims, they depend on this person to see it and that person to see it, and they don't make an effort to go out and see it. It is a part of our deen. We should want to see it. So the Prophet's son says, Sumu li ruyatihi wa aftiru li ruyatihi. Right? Fast, all of you, when any one of you see it, that is the crescent. And stop fasting, all of you, when any one of you see it. Fast, Sumu, all of you fast. It's a command for everybody. Li ruyatihi, when it is seen. It is seen. Li ruyatihi. That is the crescent. When the crescent is seen, it did not specify how much. And stop passing when it is when anyone sees it. And if it is if it is obscure from you by whatever means, cloud or whatever else, right? Then complete 30 days of Shaban by counting. Then complete 30 days of Shaban by counting. You count the days of Shaban. However, the the crescent is that is, the new moon is not sighted, then 30 days of Shaban have to be completed by counting. The following day would mark the beginning of the new month, whether or not the present is sighted. Right? So there can be no more than 30 days in an Islamic month. No more than 30 days. No less than 29 days. The Islamic month is either 29 days or 30 days. So if the moon is not sighted after the 29th day, regardless of the reason, if it is cloudy or whatever the case might be. We don't worry. We have the answer. And this is how Islam is. Everything is simple. I mean, even with this virus that is going around, that is, that is making people going crazy, including many Muslims, Islam has the answer. Right? Just be patient. Just submit to your Lord. You know? And deal with it from there. Deal with the thing positively. Focus. You have Ramadan coming up and you worry about the little virus and you have to die anyways in case it kills you. Then inshallah you're a martyr. I mean, alhamdulillah, you shouldn't worry. You try to keep away from all the negatives as possible and that, that can affect you, but you don't kill yourself behind it and spend the whole day worrying about it and posting this and posting that. That's all I see. This one posting about the, about the virus and that one posting something contrary then the other one posting something. And it's confusing. And it takes away people, it takes away the, the, the regular people, their mind from what is more important. And this is how Satan is playing with us. Satan is tying us up before Ramadan starts. He's getting us so distracted that Ramadan is going to come and we might still be talking about controvirus. And we would not have prepared anything. And all we would do is go into the fasting like any old, uh, any old act of worship without understanding its requirements, without understanding, I mean, you know, the regulations governing it. So, inshallah, you know, be careful. So, what is the passage set for the beginning of Ramadan? 
So you understand how that is set up. Inshallah, let us finish off with this. We maybe we'll finish with this and then we will stop, inshallah. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took great care, and this is what I wanted to say, but I knew I had put it in here, so took great care to determine the beginning of Sha'ban. Not the beginning of Ramadan, the beginning of Sha'ban. The beginning of what? Sha'ban, brothers and sisters. You know why? Because let us say it was cloudy on the day of Sha'ban, the 29th day. Right? So they had to count 30. Right? And let us say they didn't have a proper count on that time. And so it was cloudy for a few days. And actually, it went over. You know, the 30th day, they, they had it as 29th day, and it went over to the 30th day. You know? And then, I mean, so when they see the moon, or they count 30 days, but they, let us say the previous month, Rajab was not properly established, then um, Shaban would start on the wrong day. So he used to take very great care in establishing Shaban. Because if Shaban is not established properly, then there's high likelihood that Ramadan, because one year I knew, like in my country, back home, I was in Guyana at that time, when they had 28 days of fasting, and they saw the moon the next day, um, the night, you know, so. But it's like that is because they make a lot of, they do a lot of crazy things. I mean, the regular people who don't spend their time learning this deen, they cause a lot of confusion, right? The Messenger of Allah, so Salam took great care to determine the beginning of Shaban. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, radiallahu anha, said, the Messenger of Allah used to be more concerned about determining the beginning of Shaban more than other months. You understand that? You understand this? This is very important. Inshallah. All right, okay. The appearance of the crescent is established by two trustworthy Muslims confirming the sighting. And if two witnesses testify, then, start, then fast or stop fasting. So this is the limit. Other scholars hold that even if one trustworthy Muslim confirmed the sighting of the crescent, it's enough based on the, the, the statement of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. People were looking for the moon. So I informed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that I had seen it. So he fasted and commanded people to fast. Some scholars have, in addition to saying um, two people, some say, no, you can use one to start the beginning of the month and you can use, you, but you must use two to see the ending of the month. Right? And they have some arguments which you don't really want to get into. Right? This hadith, however, is establishing that one trustworthy person is enough for the sighting, inshallah. And Allah knows best. Right? So as long as we hear, inshallah, we can start fasting. One of the important issues in relation to Ramadan, uh, to fasting, is that it is a pillar of Islam. Fasting in the month of Ramadan has a very noble position in Islam, since it is one of its fundamentals. One of its fundamental pillars. Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, "Buni al-Islam wa ala khams. Islam is built upon five. Awalan, shaharati an la ilaha illallah. When the Muhammad Rasulullah testifying that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. But he come the salah. He come the salah. It's not just praying salat, right? You know that? He come the salat is different from praying salat, brothers and sisters. He come the salat is different from praying salat. Everybody is praying salat, but not everybody is establishing salat. Everybody is praying, but not everybody is establishing salat. Salat has requirements for it to be established. So inshallah, one of these days we are going to talk about that inshallah, you know, in this same classes because, I mean, we, we want to also do, do the salat in these classes. To pay the zakat, pay the zakat, or sawm Ramadan. And this is what is important, this is the proof that we are searching for in this in this hadith. Sawm Ramadan. Wa hajj al-bayt man istata'i lagi sabila. And making the pilgrimage to Mecca for the one who has the ability to do it, right? So there's a consensus amongst the Muslims for the obligation of the fasting, of fasting the month of Ramadan. Thus, whoever denies this obligation has disbelief. Now, notice what he says here. There is a consensus among the Muslims that fasting the month of Ramadan is an obligation upon Muslims who qualify. Okay, we said they must qualify. Thus, whoever denies this obligation has disbelieved. So if somebody says, no, fasting is not something that is required from us, and we don't need to fast, we don't have to fast, that person is a disbeliever. He has left the fall of Islam. Because Allah has made it an obligation. You know, inshallah, we have to really be careful of what we say and how we say it. Um, inshallah, next week we're going to do the wisdom behind 
obligating the fasting of Ramadan, inshallah. And we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and make this information valuable for us and make this information beneficial for us. Okay? I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand our position in this world. That we are a slave and he is our master. And that he is the one that we have to make sure that we devote ourselves to all the time. All the time. Okay, brothers and sisters? He is la ilaha illahu. There is no deity worship, worship, worship but him. Okay? So you have to know him. You have to understand how to relate to him. You have to know this. This is something that is an essential. This is not regular. This is essential. Okay? So we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to focus on this kalim. La ilaha illallah. We, help, we, 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 we ask him to help us to understand the obligations that this kalima place on us if we say we believe in it, like salat and fasting and hajj and, 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 and zakat and spending our money in his way and doing uh, sadaqah and all these other things that are so important for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and strengthen us and give us the best of this world hereafter and save us from the punishment of hell. May Allah forgive us and our parents and our families and our, our zuriya or our progeny that is going to come after us. May he guide all of us, help us all to be in the establishment of prayers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and accept from us and give us jannah for, and, and protect us from hell. Us and those, our Muslim brothers and sisters who died before us in the Iman and those who are going to come after us. May Allah forgive us all and grant us jannah. Ameen. Subhanakallah. Wa bihamdik. Shalom la ilaha ila anta. Astaghfirullah. We like with jazakum. Allahu khairan. Barakulah fiqh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and get us all.